What we talked about last week was this new kingdom Jesus mentions, right? He says you're all part of a new kingdom. He introduces this kingdom. He starts talking about it. A lot of his parables, in fact, are about the kingdom. This, the kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like this. And he keeps kind of putting it out there. This is what the kingdom is like. This is what the king is like. This is how this works. This is how this, this makes sense. And as he introduces all those things, he keeps kind of opening up some new vistas for us. Well, my thinking about this is if the king... If God, the king, is unchangeable, and the kingdom is a representation of the king, then those things that we learn in the New Testament about this kingdom should be able to be found across the scripture. Is that logically logically sensible to you? Does that make, make sense? You follow that logic anyway? Okay. Thank you for the one or two people who audibly actually answered other than just nodding your head. So... What I wanted to do today was take a first step in this process to kind of look back and ask the first question, do we actually find any of, things as, any of these things as we go back and start looking into the Old Testament text? And this morning, as uh, Kailana read, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 17 a bit. Genesis chapter 17. And as you're looking there, you're going to find the story of Abram. You're kind of dropping right into the middle of the story of Abram. And uh, it's right as that, at that point where he gets the name change from Abram to Abraham. Right kind of at this point is when he gets that name change. Biblically, when you're looking at a name change, it means something big is going to happen. Something really significant is going to happen. So <clears throat> as we talk about Abram today, I want to ask you a simple question. We'll, we'll come back to this. And, and maybe we'll have an answer by the end, but do you have any stuff? What do you have? What might you have? And what might you have that God wants to use? We're talking about this guy, this Abram, who's, as we get introduced to him in this part of the story, he's 99 years old. He's actually been living in the promised land for about 25 years. How long? 25 years. He's been there expecting the promises of God the whole time. God told him that he was going to this place. He was going to give give him this land. He's there. He's in the land. No gift yet. He's been there kind of hanging out. Decade has passed. Two decades have passed. He's, he's fought battles for his, his nephew Lot to rescue him because he's gone off to Sodom and been captured by the kings in the valley. He's met Melchizedek, the, the priest of Salem, and actually given tithe to this man. He's, he's had quite a busy time. He's been off to Egypt, lied about his wife's identity. There's been a lot going on in his life. And at 99 years old, we open up in chapter 17, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. Now, it's not the first time. God has appeared to him a couple of times. God has spoken to Abram. He's given him a few, a few clues. He's told him that he will have children as numerous as the stars, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And yet, and yet, He's just, he's got this one child. At this point, he's, he's 12. And he's really the product of Abraham and, Abram and Sarai's plan. The kid that he has isn't the one that was promised. So here we are, and he says, uh, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram, said to him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Now, if you start hearing the same story again and again and again. You keep hearing the same plan again and again and again. This is the outcome. This is the outcome. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Do you begin to doubt the storyteller? The story keeps being told. I will make you of you an exceedingly great nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heard that. Heard that. Heard that. Right. So, so, so what? 
You see, God has told him the end of the story, but he, he hasn't told him about the middle. Most of us live in the middle. Most of our lives are spent in the middle. We, we Once in a while, we'll, we'll see the end of something. We'll go, great, that was awesome. Love to see it when a plan comes together. But most of us and most of our time is spent in that middle ground somewhere. Between the promise and that promise's fulfillment. And that middle time can be pretty discouraging. It is a time when we typically do a little otherwise planning. We, we tend in the middle to be a little conniving. We tend to sort of work it out for ourselves. How can I make this thing God promised actually happen? Because God is not getting on it. And so we find our guy Abraham, 99 years old, 25 years in the promised land, hanging out somewhere in the middle. He doesn't know where the end is. He can't possibly tell what the next step is because he's just hanging out here in the middle, struggling and dealing with the fact that that's where he lives. It's where we all live. Somewhere between God's promise of the second coming and the fulfillment of that promise. We're all looking for that, that land that city whose builder and maker is God, we're all having left our home, our, our place of, of, of connection, our anchor in sin. We've said, no, we believe in something better, and we've started out on a trek with God, and we're here in the middle. What do we do while we're stuck in the middle? I want to lay this alongside a couple of New Testament passages and I want to talk about some things that have to be done while you're in the middle. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Now a mustard seed sitting there in your hand, crush them up, you could smear it on your uh, veggie dog, right? You can put it on your sandwich. Get enough of his little mustard seed friends, crush them all up, add some, some vinegar, maybe some water and some salt, and you've got mustard. But when you do that to the mustard seed, he has no, former, no, no future. At that point, he's just digestible. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man takes and plants in his garden. It's a tiny little seed. It's next to nothing. It's one of the smallest seeds in all the garden plants. And yet, it sprouts and it grows and it becomes this massive thing. You see, Abraham lives in the middle with the promise of a massive thing. Abraham is living in the middle at age 99 with the promise of nations. Not nation, but nations coming from him. God has said, I will make of you an exceedingly great nation. Your children will be uncountable. There'll be so many of them. And here he is living in the middle. While we live in the middle, it's important that we plant some seeds. You can't just live in the middle and do nothing. There's got to be some things to do. It's very important that we plant some seeds. You know, exactly how those seeds get planted, exactly which seeds, it's, it's all kind of up in the air. But it's important that we keep going and keep planting seeds. You know, we are the blossoming of someone else's seed, right? You know that, right? Someone planted the seed of Christianity in someone's life that talked to you. That was a seed coming to fruition, and you're the fruit. Welcome to Fruit World. And now you live in the middle waiting for that seed that is in you to mature so that you might pass it on to someone else and that fruit might also bear fruit. We live in the middle. It's important while you're in the middle that you plant seeds. It's important that you plant seeds. What happens next is not your problem. What happens after you plant the seed is not your problem. Um, in your garden, I know that you, you take it on as your problem, right? When you plant the seeds in your garden, you, you have a lot of issues you have to take care of. You water, right? You bring out your little watering can. Sometimes you put special things in there for the seeds, little extra spices for the seed. You kind of put them out there on the seed so the seed can get a good start. You plant it, you water it. Some weeds grow up next to your seed. You come along, you pull the weeds very, de very delicately so that your seed doesn't get disturbed. Seed sprouts. I've talked to you about this before, but do you remember third grade or first grade or second grade when they gave you the seed and told you to put it in a cup? 
Do you remember that? Did you want to get your seat out and see how it was doing? I didn't want a cup. I wanted a glass. I wanted to see what was going on there. You know what I loved in third grade? Ant farm. Because you could see what was going on down below the surface. This business of putting a seed in the dark in the, in, the, in the dirt somewhere and expecting and hoping, that wasn't my thing. I liked to be able to know what was going on. I liked to see what was happening. But what happens if you disturb the seed? If you try to coach the seed, you, you pull the seed out, look at it, say, come on, seed, come on, come on, you can do this. Put them back. Do that a couple times, your seed becomes fertilizer for whatever else is in that cup. It's an interesting statement Jesus made also in the comment about seeds. He says, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows. I like this next line. <laughs> but he does not understand how it happens. So he spread, spread the seed. and Back then he just hoped for rain because he didn't even, in Jerusalem or in Israel, around Israel, he didn't even have a way to get water to it. Might carry it out in a bucket once in a while in an extreme case, but man, you didn't water an entire field you know, with a bucket. You just dropped a seed, prayed for rain. Risky business, isn't it? But what happens after the seed is planted is not up to you. In your spiritual life, you'd get rid of a lot of angst if you just realized this. If you love your neighbor and take care of your neighbor and talk to your neighbor about Jesus, what happens to that seed is not your problem. Now, I don't, I'm not saying neglect your neighbor and say, okay, I planted it, too bad for you if you die. Okay, hell is coming, <laughs> it's up to you now. I'm not talking about that kind of disregard, but I am saying you can't convert a person. None of us has the ability to do that. We simply give the person the good news about Jesus and let him go to work. And you try not to misrepresent him in the process. Trying really hard not to, you know, whack your neighbor's kid because they got on your lawn. Not to yell at them about parking their car in front of your driveway. You know, not to go fishing in their garbage can for what they, no, I don't know what you do. <laughs> but try to live like Jesus next door so that he has a shot. You, it's important that we plant seeds, but what happens to the seed is a miracle of God. Abraham stuck in the middle and God said, hey, buddy, there's going to be a nation that comes out of you. There's going to be an amazing harvest from you. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be more than you can imagine. There will be more seed. But Abraham has no seed. He's 99 years old. His body has stopped doing that. You fellas know what I'm talking about? Those of you, you know, older fellas? His wife's body has stopped preparing for that. There's no way this can happen. This is not available any longer. Store is closed. He's 99, she's 90. No more childbearing. It's not going to happen, God. There is no more seed, God. It's not going to happen. Abraham has no seed. He's there in the middle. God is making promises. God... God, God's going to have to keep. You see, this is the interesting thing about these miraculous promises. Miraculous things are not regularly done in times when you can handle it. You know what I mean? If you can do it, if you've got a handle on it, if you're okay, you can do this in a moment. You can pull out your wallet, you can write the check, you can make this thing happen because you are the man or woman. God doesn't need to step in at that moment. But when you are up against it, when you have no more seed, and all the crops before have failed, then what happens next is God's business. See, Abraham has been in the Abraham business for a while. Abraham's been working Abraham's plan for a while. But now Abraham, Abraham has no more plan. He says, God, factory's closed, man. This is not happening. I don't have any more seed. I've done all that I can do. It's interesting that at this moment, God changes his name from exalted father, which is a cool name. 
Wouldn't you like to have that name? You know, your children walk in the house and they say, Exalted Father. Good morning, Exalted Father. You would let your kids call you by your name, wouldn't you? Call me by my first name, son. Come in. Oh, Exalted Father. Can I borrow the car, Exalted Father? It'd be awesome. Wouldn't that be a good name? It'd be an awesome name. I think I might change my name. You're going to change your name from Exalted Father to the Father of many. This is a mockery to this man. This is a mockery to him. Somebody walks into Abraham's house now and says, yeah, father of many. Where are they? Father of many, right, you, yeah, Abraham, dried up 99-year-old Abraham and his wife. <laughs> no, you're not the father of many. God didn't give you that name. You gave yourself that name, right? Yeah, you got that thing tattooed on your uh, knee. Because you wanted everybody to think, but it ain't true. Father of many. This is a mockery of Abraham. He's 99 and out of seeds. The day God shows up, the day God finally decides to change his name, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And when Abram fell on his face, God talked to him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be Abraham, or Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I have made you. I have already made you. You are already the father of many nations. But God, listen, I started here in this this land that you promised me that I haven't gotten yet, by the way, I started here when I still had a chance. I was 74. You know, 74 is kind of the prime of life. I was going well. Things were happening for me back then. It's 25 years since I got here. I still don't have a deed to nothing. And I got this one kid who I had to go out and get for myself. I appreciate the help, kind of, I appreciate the, the promise, the, the sales job you've been sending to me for 25 years, but come on. There's nothing left here. You're barking up the wrong tree. You, there's no other things that can be done. I'm done. Exalted Father. You realize as soon as I tell my wife that that's my new name, she's going to laugh at me. She laughs easy. You know that. Yeah, <laughs> Sarai, you really don't want that name. Sarai kind of means a grumpy woman, kind of a naggy wife. Here's the exalted father and his naggy wife. Hey, Sarai, God changed my name today. Really? Change your name to old man with no seed no change my name to the father of many <laughs> you're kidding right you're kidding he didn't really do that to you god did that to you god did that to you oh man he doesn't like you anymore everybody when i'm gonna go tell some people somebody needs to hear about this and she goes out tells the servants you know what abraham's, abraham's name is abraham you know what abraham means it means father of many look around where's the many just my imagination that i wouldn't want to go tell my wife that was my new name but i want you to catch the tense God said, I have already made you. I have made you the father of many nations. Hmm. So perhaps God isn't limited 
by what I lack. Perhaps, perhaps God is waiting for me to get to the point where I know I can't do it anymore myself. Maybe the whole deal is for me to get to the point where I have to trust him and stop believing in me, where I have to trust that he knows what he's doing better than I know what I'm doing. I, maybe I have to get to the point where I say, I have no more seed. There's no more planting here. There's no more options here. I can't do it, God. There's no way that I can be the father of many. Maybe I have to get to the point where I can't trust myself for this so that all I can do, the only thing I have left is to trust God for this. Maybe that's what he's waiting for. Maybe that's what he was wanting all along. It's taken 25 years for Abraham to get to this point. Who do you think was really waiting? Was Abraham waiting? Or was God waiting? Was God saying, can we just, can we just get to the point where you say, okay, you do it because I can't? Can we just get to the point where, where you say, God, if this is going to happen, it's going to have to be a miracle because that's the plan, bud. The plan is miracle. The plan is you can't do this on your own. The plan is I am God and you are not and I will handle this if you'll just get to that place where you are ready for me to do it. Some of us are so stone-hearted and so hard-headed that we have to be in a place where we have no other option left before we'll look up. Where some of us get to that point where we're saying, I can't believe where God has placed me in my life. I've come to the point where I have no more money. I have no more stuff. I have no job. I have nothing left. Here I am at the end of my rope. Why did God do this to me? Because up to now, you've been depending on you. He had to empty out your bank account. He had to get rid of all of your stuff. He had to finally get you to take the last thing you had down and, and hawk it for a little cash before you would say, God, I'm done and I need your help. Some of us are so hard-headed we have to get there and it seems to me that this is our guy Abraham because 25 years he's been wandering around the promised land living in between. And God says, I have made you the father of many. God is not bound by Abraham's timetable. God is not limited by Abraham's lack. See, Abraham got there and he said, look, hey, I'm moving into a new land. God has called me into this new place. I'm gonna cool it, drive in here. I'm gonna roll in here. I'm gonna take some stuff over. God's gonna start moving people out. My, my kids are gonna be born. The, the land's gonna start being filled up with my kids. It's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be fantastic. I'm sure Abraham had a plan for how he was gonna take over the promised land, wouldn't you? If God had said, you're gonna go to this place, it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be yours. They're gonna give you, give you all the land. In fact, he reinforces this with Lot, right? Lot takes the best land and God says, nah, don't worry about him. Just walk around the whole land. I'm giving you everything here. Go take a look at what's yours. Go walk around the Bentley, guys. It's yours. Go, go walk around that Mercedes Benz you've been wanting. It's yours. I'll give it to you. Just walk around. Check it out. Abraham goes all around the whole land and he sees all the great things that are there, all the giant cities that are there, all the giant people that are there. And he goes, I'm not worried about these people. God says, you and you and you and you are mine. 25 years later, he's got nothing. Anybody there? Anybody had a lot of expectations that haven't come? Were you that guy in the yearbook voted most likely to succeed? And here you are, 25 years later, saying, man, I don't know. I don't know, God. I, I don't seem to have, to have made it happen. Are you that girl who went all the way through high school? 4.0, most popular kid in school. 
You were voted right alongside that most likely, likely to succeed. You told them, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to be a professional. And at the bottom under your picture in the yearbook, it says, you know what I'm going to be by the time I'm 45? Rich. And 45 came. And here you are. You don't even have seeds anymore. That's Abraham. That's Abraham when God shows up. That's what's going on in that day. He had a plan and God didn't follow it. And now he's out of options. So let me ask you the final question, the, the important question. If you're at the end of your rope, what do you have left? What do you have left? There's no more of you. And God is all that's left. <laughs> it's a funny thing to say, isn't it? God is all I have left. <sighs> Sometimes people use prayer and the call to God as the last resort. You walk into the hospital and you say, uh, I've come here I'm to, to pray with you, Mrs. Johnson. And Mrs. Johnson gets this frightened look on her face. And she looks around and she says, what do you know about my condition? I think you're going to be fine. I just came to pray with you. Oh, but you're, you're, you're praying. Doesn't that mean I'm dying? No, it just means I came to pray with you. Oh, Whew. I was worried there for a minute. What do you have left? <laughs> Moses had been a prince in Egypt. You know what he has left? A stick. Literally, a stick. A rod, the Bible calls it, but a rod is just a, a, a nice name for a stick. It's a big stick. It's a stick he uses to, to you know, beat up the sheep with, guide the sheep with, gently. No sheep were harmed in the filming of this message. But all he really has is a stick, and God says, hey, that stick will do. Now that I've gotten rid of the prince of Egypt, now that I've gotten rid of, oh, I'm from the bloodline of Judah, now that I've gotten rid of all of the things that make Moses Moses, we can start 40 years wandering through the desert later. All he had left was a stick. <laughs> Nicodemus, he had... He had some cash. He had this much courage. But Jesus said, I can take that and I can work with it. Peter, I, I heard, a, heard a pastor say, Jesus picked Peter because he had a boat. <laughs> there was no way to get around, the, around the, the lake. You needed somebody with a boat, so he picked Peter. He had a boat. What do you have left? Now, some of you are like 25, and you're saying, I have a whole life ahead of me. I'm awesome. I have great potential. I am, I am the one who was voted most likely to, see, to succeed. I am the, the king and queen of the prom. I am the whatever and the whatever and the whatever. That's awesome. Can you realize that what you have will only work if you put it into God's hand? You see, Abraham will find out because God says, guess what? By this time next year, your wife, the grumpy one, she's going to have a baby. It's going to be amazing. In fact, we're changing her name too. We're going from grumpy wife to Princess Sarah. The princess. So it's the princess and the father of many nations. You know what that is? That's the princess and the king, right? The father of a nation is a king. Huh. Faucet turns back on. I, I don't know how to say that more gently. <laughs> 
Sarah, who has never had a child, suddenly becomes pregnant. Now, don't think about the fact that she's 90 for a minute. Just think about that fact that she's been waiting for this for her entire adult life. This is the greatest gift she ever gets. What did she have left? She had nothing left. What did Abraham have left? He had nothing left. But right there was where God wanted them to be because now they would turn and rely entirely on him. Abraham says, when God says, I'll give you another son, he says, well, why? I got one. I kind of worked this out, you know. It's uh, Ishmael. We, I know that wasn't quite the way you had planned, but, you know, and he said, it's okay. I know you love your son. I'll make a great nation of him as well. Nation number two, by the way. <clears throat> One of my concerns for all of us is that we have so much left. Almost anybody in America, almost anybody in America has so much left. One of my big concerns for us is that it's so easy to still rely on myself. It's so easy to still rely on my stuff. It's so easy to believe that I've got this, that I'm okay, that I'm going to handle it myself. We're going to do things the old-fashioned way and do it ourselves. Hard work, sweat of the brow. And I have nothing against hard work or brow sweating. But we have to realize our dependence on God. I do not want to get to the point where all I have left is a stick. You need two sticks to start a fire. I don't want to be that stubborn. I don't want to have to hit that wall. So I want to talk to those of you who, are, who still have a one at the beginning of your birth date. So there's a one there at the beginning, right? Right? You're, either, you, you, you're 11 and up to 19. You've still got a one. Surrender to God is the only answer. There are no other answers. Surrender to God is the only answer. If you still got a one before you're, you're, you're at the beginning of your birth date, if, you, if you're still a one on your cake, Find somebody with like a six or a seven at the beginning of theirs and ask them about their experience. Because they have been through, I'll do it myself, and they have probably also been through, okay, God, I have nothing left. Ask them how they did that. If you've got a two at the beginning, same thing. Surrender is still and always will be the answer. Surrender your will, surrender your desires, surrender your plan. And that goes until you're 100. That goes until you're 125 or however old you decide you're going to end up being. The answer is always the same. It's a daily, continuous process of surrendering my plan to God. What do you have left? Peter's walking, or Jesus is walking along the shore one day. Crowd begins to form. The crowd gets so big that Jesus is getting forced into the water. Think about this. Think about this massive crowd pushing against Jesus, and, and he's starting to move back into the water. There's a couple of boats sitting there. He hops into one of the boats. He does not ask permission. He just gets in the boat. And then he asks Peter push off a little bit from the shore. Would you push out a little bit? And so Peter pushes out a little bit from the shore. 
And now Jesus is safe to preach because before that he might have been trampled and drowned. And he's sit, sitting in a boat next to Peter. They, they finish the sermon. He, amazing things happen in this process. And, <clears throat> and in, this mo- in this moment, he turns to Peter at the end of the sermon and he goes, I don't see any fish in your boat, buddy. If you don't see fish in in, in Pastor Tim's boat, it's because he's a catch and release guy. So I don't see any fish in your boat, buddy. He goes, we fished all night, Lord, and we didn't find anything. He goes, push out into the deep and drop down your net for a catch. Notice Jesus doesn't say, drop down your net to fish some more. He says, drop down your net for a catch. This is the problem with fishing, is fishing is not catching. You can stand all day drowning worms and never catch anything. If they called it catching, if it actually happened like that, everybody would do it. He says, drop down your nets, lower your nets for a catch. You remember what happens next? Pull starts to pull in the nets, and they are so full that they're beginning to swamp the boat. He calls over his friends, because when Jesus is in your boat, a lot of stuff can happen. When you loan your stuff to Jesus, miraculous things can happen. He has to call over his friends to help. When Jesus is in your boat, even your friends get blessed. Starts to pull it on, starts to pull it on, and they get this massive load of fish into these boats. The boats are so full, they're almost swamping. They're sitting so low in the water just because of the weight of all of these fish. Because Peter loaned his boat to Jesus. What do you have left? Moses loans his rod to God, and he waves it over the Red Sea and the sea parts. What do you have left? Abraham and Sarah give their dried up old selves to God, and they have a son they call laughter. Because no one would believe this story. What do you have left? What's what's holding you back from handing that to Jesus? I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's a talent of yours. I don't know if it's a problem of yours. You know, you can hand your problems to Jesus too, right? Very often he turns those into blessings. I don't know if it's some brain cells you're trying to keep from him. I don't know if it's unwillingness. It's that little tiny lack of stepping across the the line of faith. I don't know what it is. What do you have left? What do you have left that you might give to Jesus for him to use in this, your one and only life? What do you have left? Whenever you, whatever, whenever you decide to give it to him, he's the one in charge of what happens next. Abraham begets Isaac. Isaac begets Jacob and Esau. Esau forms another nation called Edom. Third nation. Isaac has 12 dysfunctional children, 13 actually. And another nation is born. And Sarah dies and Abraham marries and he has six more kids. When God turns on the fountain, he leaves it on. When God starts to bless you, the blessings multiply. And Abraham becomes the father of the Midianites, another nation. Abraham becomes the father of about five nations. He had nothing left. But he gave his nothing to God. And that's what God can do with nothing. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It isn't much when you start out. But if you drop it in the soil, 
I knew let God take it from there. It can become the size of a tree. And it becomes the blessings to everyone who passes by. What do you have left? Let's pray. Father God, help us to understand what we're holding out. The habit we won't give up that is preventing us from taking the next step with you. The half-hearted commitment of our time the talent that we use only for ourselves. Lord, I don't know what it is. But I pray that you will point it out to us. So that we might give it to you and let you take it from there. I pray for the outpouring of your spirit on this congregation of people here today and those that are part of this Grace Point family wherever they are today. Those that are watching online that have no connections even here, I pray that you will pour your spirit on and into each life. That all of us would trust you enough to give you what we have left to surrender ourselves, our time, our treasure, our talent, to let you handle it because we believe in you. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us through video today. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this presentation and that you will be blessed. Don't forget you can follow us on Facebook, you can follow us on Instagram, and you can follow us at graceisthepoint.org.